how do I, how do I one set goals that are based on my values instead of, Mm -hmm. you know, all the things that I've been taught to value. And then once I kind of establish what my actual aligned goals are, how do I figure out what, what would I need in order to actually make that happen? Welcome to Story Power, a bi-monthly podcast where my guests and I geek out about the stories we are passionate about in all different genres, styles, and formats. My name is Lucinda Sage Midgordon, and I started this podcast in the summer of 2020 at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. As I watched the reaction of my friends, family, and social media circle, I noticed that many people turned to stories for comfort and help in making sense of the craziness going on around them. My goal was to do the same for my listeners, but as I chatted with my guests throughout the first year, I discovered that their personal stories were the most fascinating thing about each episode. Neil Gaiman says, Fairy tales are more than true, not because they tell us that dragons exist, but because they tell us that dragons can be beaten. I now know that sharing our experiences with others helps us defeat our own dragons. It is our stories that connect us to one another. Let's see what wisdom today's guest has to share with us. So, Sarah, I am so happy to have you on the show. Sarah DeGrave is my guest for episode 52. So I was looking at your Podmatch profile, and I'm so excited to have you on the show because you're a theater artist, but also I love the idea of your coaching business. So welcome to the show. And do you want to tell us about all of that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me and reaching out. I was so excited to read about your podcast. I was like, this is fascinating and something we need to talk about more, which is kind of how my coaching business got started. I was like, these are things we need to talk about more. Really? <laughs> um, yeah. A few years ago, I I kind of started getting, I've always sort of been drawn to wanting to work for myself and, mm-hmm. you know, talk about the things that I find important mm-hmm. and have work that is really deeply meaningful to me. And that, you know, supports a career in theater. I'm still active in theater as a performer and a creator. And, you know, I want, I want all of my work to be in harmony. Mm-hmm. And so several years ago, I, I stumbled upon restorative exercise, which is this movement, kind of approached a movement by biomechanist Katie Bowman. And I started listening to her podcast years ago. And, and as she was talking about things about the way that our body works and just like a lot of things that I was like, why did no one tell me this like 10 years ago or as a child, like all these kind of aches and pains that I could have avoided just through changing kind of my everyday natural movement patterns. And Mm -hmm. so I've always been attracted to that kind of those topics around like ourself and our kind of holistic wellness and our mental wellness and Mm -hmm. um, having what I found is kind of the key theme throughout my work is like having the information to make empowered choices for ourselves and whether that's around our bodies and just like knowing enough about how they work to make choices like even if those choices are to wear high heels because we love them like it's I feel like we deserve to know how is that affecting my alignment? How is that Mm -hmm. affecting the strength of my pelvic floor and like Mm -hmm. be able to connect the dots for ourselves and then make a choice about it and Mm -hmm. make a choice about our values and our priorities. And as I got into that work, I found that I just kept wanting to talk about these larger kind of life Mm -hmm. themes Mm -hmm. as opposed to just the nitty gritty kind of sciencey body stuff, which I also find really fascinating. But over the past couple of years, I really like started really getting what I'm doing is more towards life coaching. And I'm like, I should just let myself go in this direction. And so over the past year, I've really wanted to reconnect with the creative community and kind of bring those conversations to Mm -hmm. art and theater, especially because that's kind of what I'm most involved in. But I think all kind of artistic creative work, we have these, these really unhealthy dynamics that lead us to feel like failures and 
Mm-hmm. I've also had a lot of like in my personal journey around kind of learning about myself and what I need in order to actually achieve the artistic goals that I have and like all of the areas in my life where I felt just like a lot of shame around my lack of ability to write that play or book that gig or, you know, do these mm-hmm. dream projects or even the small things like learning the piano. Like for <laughs> years, I wanted to learn the piano mm-hmm. and I just couldn't quite understand why it wasn't working for me. Like, why couldn't I get myself to do this thing that I knew like deep down, I had like such a burning desire and like longing and like, it made me so sad that I couldn't express myself in this way. And yet I couldn't kind of like crack the code of like, so why don't I just learn how to play piano? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) And so a lot of the work that I'm doing now is kind of like supporting artists and, and exploring for themselves. What is it that I actually value how do I, how do I one set goals that are based on my values instead of, mm-hmm. you know, all the things that I've been taught to value. And then once I kind of establish what my actual aligned goals are, how do I figure out what, what would I need in order to actually make that happen? And I think that's a conversation we don't have a lot. We're just like, just do it. Yes. <laughs> We're like, pick the biggest goal you can think of and then just do it. And like, none of us really work that way. Some of a small percentage of us work that way. And most of us don't. Right. Most of us don't. Yeah. Well, yes, my husband and I were talking to a friend of ours over Christmas break in Missouri. Uh, we were there for uh, Christmas his, with his family and they were both saying, I just want to be creative and I don't want to have to do the financial part of it. I just want to be creative and have people come and see my work. And and I have come recently to the realization that I have to somehow learn how to market my work. Mm-hmm. I need to know how, and I don't have to do it in a smarmy, I don't want to do it in a smarmy way. Uh, but I have right. to I have to take responsibility for figuring out how to earn money doing what I'm doing and and uh that has been a block for me for years and so when I saw your that you do coaching in that I was really fascinated with that because I think some some of us who are creative we just want to be creative. We don't want to have to do the business part of the creativity right. you know, <laughs> journey, if you want to call it that. And so I, I loved your question about what is a creative mission statement? And then I picked another one. What are some ways to decide which creative opportunities to pursue? It was like, oh, yeah. And you had a couple of other questions that I thought were just so fantastic for, for us to think about. Mm -hmm. So do you want to talk about those a little bit? How do you choose what to work on? Mm. Most, most people with creative type brains, it's like ping, 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 like idea generation machines. I know that's how my brain works. And it's Mm -hmm. like, takes, takes a lot of tools and, and energy to just like organize our thoughts and ideas and, and to figure out when am I being pulled in a, in a new direction, because that's where I want to go. And when, you know, is that just because I'm a highly creative person, I'm always going to be pulled in five directions and I need to kind of Mm -hmm. figure out a system. For me, I've, I realized it's really valuable to figure out how do I kind of honor those ideas by placing them in a safe storage container (laughs) so that they feel seen and not like I'll forget about them if I don't do them right now. And that kind of brings this sense of calm to be like, oh, right, I can come back to this later. I think for me, I have a very like strong sense of time urgency. Mm. And so it's like now or never, like everything is now or never. Mm-hmm. And it kind of takes some work to kind of work through that, I guess, like internal fallacy and be okay with like, oh, it's like slow is okay. Mm-hmm. Or like later is okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, here's what I'm choosing for now. So I think that's something that a lot of artists struggle with is that kind of like one just choosing between all the ideas that we really want to do and then there's this whole separate question of like are these ideas that I actually really want to do or are they ideas that I feel like I should do oh yeah Uh, and I think as a theater artist I've experienced that in this kind of I feel like actors especially 
And I'm sure lots of other artists are trained to just say yes to every opportunity. Mm -hmm. There's kind of this, I was just thinking about this actually the other day and I was like, there's kind of this, we're trained to feel like we are expendable and therefore we have to say yes to everything Mm. because like we don't, we don't really hold value like as individuals Mm -hmm. and as artists. And I think there's like this whole undermining of our self-worth throughout our lives, either through people, some people don't have supportive families. And Mm -hmm. I had a really supportive family and, and I did go to school for theater and my parents were supportive of me being a theater major, Mm -hmm. which not everyone has that blessing. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. But even then, like some of these conservatory training programs, the things that get drilled into you can mm-hmm. really kind of undermine your own agency. And no one really asks you, like, what what do you want? Who are who are you? Right. I mean, they ask you, who are you as like a branding? Like, how can you sell yourself? Mm-hmm. But not like, what do you value? <laughs> yes, I I love that because I think two things that you said made me think of myself Yes. One thing was that I, I don't want to be a brand. I, Mm -hmm. I want to just let the creative process that I have chosen to do grow organically. Uh, But also there is that whole thing of I'm expendable. And that's, you know, I fought against that, but I didn't really know how to articulate it. And the other thing that you said, something you said made me think of, I have lots of creative ideas too. And sometimes it's sabotaging the thing that I'm working on at the moment. I Mm want to go off and do that other, that new thing instead of finishing the thing. thing. Yeah. That new exciting thing, because the thing that I'm working on right now is hard. You know, I'm working on my second novel and I've been working on it for a long time and it's hard. The creative part for me is hard. I love it when it's, I get to rearrange it and edit it and add new things, but yeah, the, it's create. almost like a relationship where like that first there's like that honeymoon phase mm. and then you get into the day to day where like mm-hmm. now you have to deal with each other's, you know, habits and mm-hmm. <laughs> kind of quirks. And then maybe a pandemic happens and you're, you know, not around each other 24 seven and <laughs> And it's the same with like our creative projects. It's like this, there's this honeymoon phase where it's like, this is really exciting. Mm -hmm. And we kind of have this burst of energy to create it. And then it gets into the kind of the, like the drudgery (laughs) period where we have to kind of do, put in a little bit more effort to maintain that. um, The nitty gritty. Romance. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Well, uh, you know, I have been teaching theater for 20 years now or more. And, uh, but I was doing theater before that. I have degrees in theater too. And I loved that process. But then when I des- I had to decide, am I going to, you know, be with my husband, work on our relationship, or am I going to pursue theater? So when I got to teach theater, it was this great, the answer kind of to my desire to continue to do it. But one of the things that I realized was that I'm trying to teach my students that even if you don't pursue theater as a degree, you're going to learn something about human nature and about yourself. So you could do it as a, a hobby, maybe. And that would be good. But yeah, I, some of my students are very creative and they have regular everyday jobs, but on the side, they're making films or they're involved in an improv group or they're involved yeah. in the little community theater that started before the pandemic. And, and I can't believe it's still here. And now it's starting to thrive uh, because we live in a fairly small town and, you know, the theater companies usually didn't survive. The improv group has pretty much survived. So it's really great to see them be creative, even if they have to go work someplace else. Yeah. And I think that's an area where we really under underserve artists, especially in the kind of higher education, that there's this messaging of if you want to be 
quote unquote successful or professional in your field that it's like this all or nothing Mm -hmm. approach where like you either have to dedicate your life to art or you're not really an artist. Right. And like there are all, all of these options in between that we don't encourage of like, actually you, Mm -hmm. you might have, you might be multi-passionate and you Mm -hmm. might choose to do Mm -hmm. a totally different job and also do art and you might do it Mm -hmm. as a hobby. You might do it and make money off of it. And it could be like this 70, 30 ratio or 90, Mm -hmm. 10 or like 50, Mm -hmm. 50. And there's still a little, I'm, I'm hopeful that it's kind of shifting. I think it's starting to shift a little bit, but I think there's still a lot of that messaging of like, I was watching this documentary and this Broadway dancer, this was maybe from a decade or two ago that this was made. She was saying, kind of repeating one of these ingrained teachings of if I have a backup plan, then I I will fall back on it. So in Mm -hmm. other words, if I allow myself a plan B, then I will fail. And therefore I just haven't allowed myself (laughs) any other options so that I will force myself to succeed. And it just like felt so toxic to me and Mm -hmm. so like fear-based and so disempowering Mm -hmm. that we can't, that puts us in a position where we're not learning to trust ourselves to be like, you know what, I can have options and I trust myself to choose the one that I want and that is best for me and to work toward it. And also like, I am conscious that there are a lot of realities to this world where I might need to take care of myself in other ways besides art maybe I want those other jobs to be equally fulfilling. Mm-hmm. And for some people, they really love waiting tables. And that is, ends up being a great compliment to their artistic mm-hmm. work or, you know, other jobs where it's more, it's less that they chose that job intentionally and more like that was a job they could do while doing art. And I, mm-hmm. I think we really like, one of the things I'm passionate about is encouraging artists to find other meaningful work because there's a high percentage chance that, you know, even if you're pursuing art professionally and trying to make a living from it, that there's going to be a lot of periods where that's not happening. Right. And like, you deserve to have other work that is meaningful to you and that mm-hmm. suits your needs and that suits your financial needs and like takes care of you. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and I think that some artists, I've known artists who feel guilty for not completely pursuing their art and Mm -hmm. uh, you know and my husband and I've struggled with this too because he did I say he's an artist yeah I did (laughs) Um, he he's but he's a graphic artist as well so he has this whole visual art thing and the graphic art he's got both the right and the left brain going at the same time because he's really into computers and that kind of stuff but we've struggled with that starving artist thing Mm -hmm. and 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 then sometimes we feel guilty for going off and making a living so we can support ourselves yeah which is wild when you like kind of step back and look at it like Mm -hmm. that that would make us feel guilty Mm -hmm. I'm I'm taking care of my physical mental emotional needs Mm -hmm. and I feel guilty about it well and I teach a class called Dramatic Structure. And one of the movies I chose for the students to watch this time was called Loving Vincent. It's an animated film and the artists animate, they filmed it just like a regular movie. And then each frame was painted in the style of Vincent van Gogh. So that's how it's animated. But he didn't have any money. He was so passionate about his painting that he was always getting money from his brother or um, he didn't sell very, I'm not sure he sold any paintings when he was alive, Uh, but he was a prolific painter and, but he was also destitute practically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we kind of hold that kind of artist up as the, pinnacle of artistic success you don't sell anything while you're alive you but (laughs) your but your paintings are sold for millions and millions of dollars after you die well I kind of wish we weren't 
we didn't have that. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's kind of a weird ideal. <laughs> and, is. and I understand like the, I definitely relate to like, how amazing would that be to be able to just work on your art all the time? But yeah, we definitely need some alternatives between like, you're either Van Gogh or you're, you know, corporate nine to five mm. and you only get to paint on the weekends mm-hmm. for your own pleasure. Like there's, there's all of these options in between. Mm-hmm. And I've definitely struggled throughout my life to kind of be financially independent and to work. Mm-hmm. And not, and a lot of that, I feel like part of that, at least, I mean, there were a lot of things contributing to that, but part of it was that no one really, you know, in college when I was studying theater all the time, no one really asked me like, what do you think you want to do to support yourself financially while you try to become a working actor? Right. Like, how, how can we identify, you know, your strengths mm-hmm. and the things that you are learning in theater? Because like, so like I can see now so many of the skills I have, I'm like, I'm highly adaptable and dependable Mm-hmm. sometimes like in applying for jobs before people will be like, well, how are you, you know, handle this situation? I'm like, Oh, that's not a problem. Like <laughs> I, I've been, mm-hmm. you know, if you've been in a tech rehearsal, that's not a problem. Like, mm-hmm. uh, so all of these things that I think from the outside, there's this perception that it's this kind of trivial pursuit mm-hmm. and that mm-hmm. like I think there's even, especially, I don't know if this is, well, I think it is true in other and like visual arts, but there's this perception that artists are kind of, you know, like lazy and undependable and, mm-hmm. you know, all of these kind of flaky, you know, that they don't have any hard skills. Mm-hmm. But when you look at like in theater, the way a production runs, like there's no space for that. <laughs> like right, you have to be exactly. on time and prepared and... Mm-hmm you know, I mean, especially if you look at something like swings on, on Broadway, mm-hmm. that like blows my mind. <laughs> like, Oh yeah. The, the, just the mental capacity and the level of preparation and like the ability to essentially it's like, you know, being in this kind of emergency response position mm-hmm. and we don't, I think we don't allow ourselves as artists to really recognize and value those things until someone like right you know really puts it in our face and we're like well don't you have these skills and then we're like oh well, yeah I I guess I I guess I do mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but it's not part of our training to like to identify think- those things and value them right I love the whole idea of looking at your values in terms of how you navigate your life because what you value, like I found this wonderful sweet spot of teaching theater and then, and getting to direct plays every once in a while, I got to the point where I was really glad to be backstage and not, (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. because I had done a lot of stage managing too, as well as being in productions when I was younger, but the sweet spot of being able to teach it. And then uh, there came a time where I didn't, I was, I was forced to teach English and I was like, oh man, I'm not sure I can do this. I had enough, you know, credits to be a highly qualified English teacher, even though I didn't have a degree in it. And I realized, oh, I know how to teach these students how to write a good essay. And so uh, then writing kind of came into my awareness and I decided to stop teaching and and become a writer. And then that led to the podcast. So, you know, it, it's your life is going to evolve. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I've always kind of looked at what is it that I am most passionate about? What is it that I value? And that's part of my teaching too, about teaching theater. My teaching partner is a theater professional. He's finishing up his master's. And we talk a lot to the students about how do they treat each other? How do you build trust? You know, how do you, you know, define space 
between each other. Those are all negotiable things. You always have to be careful of how you treat the other actors that you're working with, things like that. So those are skills that you need out in the world, the real world too. Yeah. All the time. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. sometimes I, sometimes I wish that other people who haven't experienced like an arts education, like had stronger skills in those areas. I'm Mm -hmm. like, Oh, I can see you're really good at this thing that I'm not great at, but also I've learned these other things that are mm-hmm. you know, really applicable to the same situation, just from a different angle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, and recognizing that we evolve over, over time and mm-hmm. that those things change. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Your creative, your creativity may take a turn, but our lives do that anyway. I mean, everyone's life does that anyway. As you age, you take turns, you retire, you, and I, I'm teen million. Well, I'm saying I'm I'm teen million, but there's a bunch of people that I know who have retired and they said, how did I get anything done when I was working? Because I'm so busy now, (laughs) now that I'm retired, I'm so, I'm still so busy. How did I get anything done? And it's, it's so funny, but our lives just keep marching along and it's never the same change is always happening so. I think there's definitely these these fa- like age related phases too I've noticed mm-hmm. I think it's partly from now being in my mid 30s and maybe a little bit of the pandemic this there is this gradual shift toward less caring about what other people think about me and my decisions mm-hmm. and and also like kind of a, I'm feeling more of a, of a pull to like speak about things and more of a comfort to speak about things mm-hmm. that bother me. Whereas like 10 years ago, I, I never would have had the, the clarity or the confidence to, to do what I'm doing now, like be a coach or and to like talk about things in, in the industry and like problematic forms. And, and I'm looking around at like audition notices because I'm still auditioning for things and being like, you know what, this is not the landscape that I want to see. Like, these are not the roles I want to see really for women mm-hmm. um, in in musical theater. And like, I'm just like a little tired, <laughs> a little tired of like that. These are the options that are always available to me, mm. and and that they're usually underpaid and overworked. And yes. like, I'm like, I'm I'm now now at a point where like I kind of want to be compensated appropriately for my time, whether that is in money or in some other kind of exchange of energy and respect for my time. And I I want to be doing roles that portray a complex, realistic character of like a, a woman's life. And I think mm-hmm. there's a lot of conversation right now about, you know, just speaking of stories about the stories that are being and that haven't traditionally been told and those voices kind of getting right a little bit more of, of, of a moment to to be highlighted and mm. produced in the in the case of theater. Well there's still there's still such a long way to go and such a large gap. And I think that's that's things that kind of drive my passion in the coaching is like I really want to be in a position to support women artists and non-binary artists to create mm-hmm. that work that tells these stories. And like, mm-hmm. I'm also working mm-hmm. on that myself. I'm kind of in the process of figuring out what do I need in order to write my first musical um, and trying to get those needs met for myself and mm-hmm. the support that I need in order for that to actually become a reality. But I'm like, I can like, if I wrote musicals for the rest of my life, that would still only be a very small number but if I can support, you know, dozens of other creators who are also creating those shows and those books and, you know, those other pieces of art that create opportunities for talented women and non-binary artists to tell stories that are, that comes up for me is like satisfying. Mm-hmm. Like there's something about really good as a singer, there's something about really good music that just feels like satisfying in your body mm-hmm. to sing. And I think it's the same with like other, other art that resonates with you. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have to be like 
I think we also, I've noticed this kind of strong judgment of what's good or bad art that I'm trying to kind of Mm -hmm. weed out in my own brain and like decondition myself from that type of thing because I think it really harms artists to like be teaching people like this art is okay to make and this art isn't or that in order to have an impact we have to make something that is like really kind of serious and um you know really like head-on addresses social issues mm-hmm. and I think there's like a really there's definitely a place for that and that's definitely needed and they do that amazingly well and in my life there's been like a really valuable place for what some people would deem like fluffy, meaningless art. Like uh, I really, growing up, I was really into and still am into like old movie musicals, like the 40s, 50s. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And some of those, like the plot lines are very thin. <laughs> the mm-hmm. musical numbers are very splashy. Like it's not about like the depth of the story. It's really about like this escapism, this mm-hmm. like, beauty and that you know for certain times in my life has been like life-saving for me to be able to escape into that right so I think like recognizing Mm -hmm. that like you can create that thing and it's not less worthy or less valuable to to the change that you want to see exactly I was but you could also create like the next sorry the next fluffy musical with an interesting female character like (laughs) exactly exactly like right. take that thing that you love and you can take it to the next evolution and be like and here's what I want to see mm-hmm. like I love this music and maybe we can improve the dialogue a bit mm-hmm. or the relationships right be- because one of my college friends was a, an early guest on story power and we were taught talk- she loves musicals and so we were talking about various musicals And one of the musicals that I just love is My Fair Lady. And she loves it too. But she said she was looking at it with a new eye. And maybe this is George Bernard Shaw maybe was trying to point this out in the original play. But the relationship between uh, Eliza and Higgins is, it's Mm -hmm. toxic. It's a toxic relationship. Mm -hmm. And so it would be, I mean, the, the music is beautiful. The costumes are beautiful, but uh, it might be nice to have some musicals where the relationships are not toxic, <laughs> you know? Right. Fun, beautiful, and not toxic. <laughs> right. That's, I think that's really the trifecta. <laughs> yeah, really. Yes. Yes. More of that, please. Well, uh, one of the things that I, uh, a couple of the things I thought that were interesting about your PodMatch profile was you said that you are identify as ADHD now. And can you talk about how that affects, or maybe it doesn't affect, maybe being creative is just the thing that you need for, <laughs> um, I, I used to work, um, as a substitute teacher, and I had two long-term sub assignments in the special ed department. They were all all year long. And um, yeah, so I was working with students who were ADHD without the education background to help, help me with that. But so can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, that's been a, a really fascinating journey just over the past couple of years that that has come up for me. And my kind of, my kind of take on on ADHD and the way that it impacts my life is that the label has been helpful to connect to communities and to connect mm-hmm. to resources and information mm-hmm. and especially for me like just like tools and systems that are more suited to the way that my brain works oh yeah instead of you know trying to con- follow all this conventional advice i think especially like building a business and having to be really like self-led and you're like learning all this new stuff and you're getting like all these ads being like, here's the one way to fix this. And here's like the only system you need for this. Yes. <laughs> it's just like, And all these people are teaching from a place of this worked for me. So it will work for you too, which is just like mm-hmm. nonsense. Right. And, but we're, you know, again, we're not really taught to kind of tune in and value and, and be okay with saying, you know what, actually that doesn't work for me. Mm-hmm. 
and I can figure out why, or I can figure out what would work better. Or I can at the very least, like not feel like a broken person because it didn't work for me Mm -hmm. or like nothing will ever work for me because these tools haven't fixed the problem. And I think for people who identify as having ADHD and for me, it's also been like, I I kind of struggle to be like, this trait is because I have this condition or, Uh you know, the things I've learned about myself over the past couple of years, I'm like, there's really no way for me to tell. One, I feel like it's just a part of every human being has a wide variety of differences. And like the scale of neurodivergence is so like what ADHD is for me is totally different than it is for someone else. And Mm -hmm. there's also really no way for me to know if like my inattention or my fatigue is due to low neurotransmitters, which is kind of the ADHD part, or if it's due to like a trauma response, or if it's due Mm -hmm. to like trying to live in a society that doesn't really align with my Mm -hmm. values and my needs, or if it's because, you know, my sleep quality is really poor because of my breathing, because I'm doing, now I'm doing a lot of work on like this chronic like jaw tension and stuff Mm -hmm. with my face and my tongue and my jaw and my neck. Mm -hmm. And I'm learning a ton of stuff in that area. And I'm like, oh, that could be the root cause of, you know, these, and there's just like, just so many potential variables Mm -hmm. of what could be the root cause. But I think what's important is that regardless of the root cause, like there's a certain need that needs to be met or a way that we operate or way that our brain functions. Mm -hmm. So like, regardless of why I'm tired, I need to find support that will help me accomplish what I need to accomplish in a way that honors the fact that I'm tired all the time until I can figure out why, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's just been this really interesting learning journey, but I think it also kind of ties back into what I was talking about, about what really resonated with me about restorative exercise and like learning, like, oh, if I just, you know, I switched my shoes to more minimal footwear and I started sitting on the floor more and just like those small changes, my menstrual cramps went away. I'm like, oh, no one ever told me, one, that you have any control over your menstrual cramps. Oh, yeah. Or two, like what like other things you can do about it besides popping a painkiller and putting a hot water bottle and like drinking some tea. Like, Right, yeah. We have the same set of like these are the top, top five tips and they're all about addressing the symptoms. Mm-hmm. And like no one has ever said like, actually, maybe there's just something going on with like the muscles in your legs and your pelvis that is making this worse or like Mm -hmm. your hormone balance that is making this worse. Mm -hmm. All of these other things that we don't really talk Mm -hmm. about as much, but with the ADHD for me, it was like the way, the way I kind of found out about that was I started seeing a new therapist and she noticed some things. She's like, I feel like we should go through this assessment (laughs) because I'm thinking maybe you have ADHD. Um, She didn't tell me right away because there's still so much stigma around it that I think, Mm. you know, People don't want to be like, I think you might have ADHD because people would be like, what? No. And I wasn't like offended or anything, but I was confused because I was, I've always been a very shy, quiet, Mm -hmm. still again, like I've had this chronic fatigue stuff. So like not, not high energy, not all of these things that we associate with kind of the stereotypical ADHD. Um, A lot of people think about, you know, like young, young boys are usually the ones who get diagnosed because they're bouncing off the walls and they're causing problems. Mm -hmm. Um, But young girls who have inattentive type who are just kind of staring out the window daydreaming and not causing anyone issues, they don't get diagnosed as much. And so the ways in which they are struggling are, are less in conflict with like other people's expectations of them, I guess Mm -hmm. is the way to describe that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So since it's not a problem for other people, they don't get the support for the things that they might be struggling with. Um, Mm -hmm. And I I definitely struggled with some stuff when I got a little bit into like the teenage that like, Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that that kind of like 14, 13, 14 zone is just like a hot mess for everyone. Oh, yeah, it is. (laughs) Uh, But definitely I started to struggle with some things that I just couldn't, I couldn't understand why, why I felt the way that I did. But now looking through it, at it through this lens, I was like, oh, that all makes so much sense now. Yeah, now. yeah. But it's, yeah, it's been this kind of like, the, we don't talk about the ways in which 
it affects adult women or what it looks like in adult women Mm -hmm. or even, even in young girls, but Mm -hmm. who then become adult women who, you know, didn't Mm -hmm. get the support younger and now are, or maybe don't notice. I think there's also this perception that if you're smart and capable that you, you can't possibly have ADHD or, you know, need support in any way. Mm -hmm. And one, I think everyone needs support in some ways. And like, Mm -hmm. maybe we should just treat people as everyone's different and everyone needs support. (laughs) Um, Instead of being like, you have to prove that you're struggling enough to get a label Uh that then allows you to get support. Yes. I think is that kind of part of the ADHD model that rubs me the wrong way. Yeah. So it's been, it's been a really interesting and there's definitely a lot of ties to like the creative brain and a lot of highly creative people also identify with these Mm -hmm. traits that give us these really amazing gifts and also these really painful struggles. Task initiation, like procrastination is really hard. And that kind of, I think the word that a lot of people use is like resistance. It's like Mm -hmm. we have this strong desire, but we also have this strong resistance and we can't really figure out where it's coming from or how to get past it. And that's been a big part of, that's really influenced my coaching and my personal approach of being like, I feel like actually most of us need a lot more support than we're getting. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that looks like structure. Sometimes it looks like, you know, having someone support you and breaking it down into really manageable pieces because lots of times for that creative brain, the prioritization is hard. Like Mm -hmm. everything feels important. And so it gets overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And it's all these little things just about the ways that our brains work. And a lot of it overlaps with that creative Mm. brain, that kind of more kind of chaotic internal experience uh, that also is very highly generative and, Mm -hmm. you know, leads to some great art. Oh, wow. That's so interesting because I could relate to some of what you were saying. Yeah. Even though I've never been diagnosed as that, but, you know, the whole needing to be quiet, needing to daydream, um, being tired a lot. Of course, I was getting up at four o'clock in the morning and going to go, <laughs> I had to be at school at <laughs> seven to teach. And then, you know, if I was directing a play, I didn't leave until four, four thirty, five o'clock. And then I'd have to go to bed at eight o'clock and that's not my time clock. That's not your <laughs> rhythm. That's not my rhythm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So but um, I was also looking at your website and you have this free PDF that you give out and people sign up for your website. Do you have a newsletter too that goes along with your website? Yeah, it's sometimes sporadic. <laughs> I did just send one out the other day. I'm trying to be, again, like consistency is hard for the creative brain. But yeah, I, I send out an occasional newsletter kind of sharing thoughts and support on on these types of topics and That's um great. yeah the the pdf is kind of this kind of a set of journaling questions which mm-hmm. i've been meaning to add this on the pdf somewhere mm-hmm. but one of the things i'm i'm trying to kind of encourage lately is to remind people that not everyone is a like a written processor mm-hmm. and that if you're a verbal processor you can take these journaling questions and like use them You can either like speak your answers out loud into like a voice Mm -hmm. dictation to text, or you can find a friend who also wants to do it and like have a conversation around it. So Mm -hmm. you can use a PDF however you want, but it's kind of like journaling type questions. Mm -hmm. And the goal is really to look at our creative goals, both as like, what do I, what do I want and need as an artist? And like, what do I want and need as a human being? Mm -hmm. And then really honoring both of those and trying to find a way to kind of merge that into a a path that, you know, honors our, our unique needs and values and wellness. Oh, that's so great. I love it. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Because I'm probably, I'll probably go sign up for it because (laughs) even though, uh, because I'm just, yes, I, I have a commitment to doing my blog once a week and, and my podcast every two weeks. Um, and I keep, I stick to that, but it's, there are other aspects of it 
that I feel like I'm still kind of struggling with. So yeah, I think there's, yeah, there's always room for us to, I don't want to say room to improve because there's just so much pressure to constantly be like improving or be like mm-hmm. <laughs> good, better, best. But I think to make these small shifts toward things that are more aligned with what we, what we want or what we need. And that's really, that's really kind of the goal is to be like, not to create some vision that then you feel like you have to live up to, but to create, that's why I call it the compass. It's more like creating a vision that then is like your kind of just your guiding point of like, here's what I'm kind of going toward. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to gradually shift in that direction Mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, here's, here's my vision board and I have to make it happen. Right. Um, Well, do you feel this way Uh, as you're talking? I'm thinking, you know, I have finally uh, in my, I'm 68. So finally in my sixties, I'm getting to a place where I am feeling comfortable with what I'm doing. There aren't very many irritants. Sometimes there are things that I love about teaching, but there are things that just really irritate the heck out of me. Like <laughs> it, it, having to go to all the little meetings and, uh, you know, do these little trainings and, you know, do the, do the reports and you know, stuff like that. Right. Uh, that stuff just like, I don't, it just really irritates me to have to do that kind of thing. But with the podcasting, right, my blog, and even writing my book, though, you know, sometimes I, I'm irritated by it too, when I can't figure out the creative, but when I'm yeah. in the creating process and I'm blocked or not blocked really, but, you know, just don't, can't quite say what I want to say. Uh, but mostly I feel so much more comfortable with the way my life is now. And, and there were lots of times when I couldn't say that I couldn't really say that even though I was doing some things that I really loved, I wasn't completely comfortable with how those played out in my life or the roles that I had in, in those creative endeavors or whatever it was. Does Mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah. Oh, okay. (laughs) That makes sense (laughs) to me. Oh, okay. Good. All right. Because, uh, yeah, I think maybe that's kind of what artists want to get to. They want to get to a place where they feel empowered, not, you were talking about that earlier. We want to feel empowered, not judged or we don't want to judge ourselves as not being worthy or whatever it is but yeah I'm yeah, feeling kind of this more fear-based mm-hmm. ju- like shame-based dynamic mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right yeah I guess I've worked through a bunch of that sort of thing already in my life so maybe that's why I'm feeling more comfortable yeah I, I'm certainly looking forward to hopefully someday feeling more comfortable and and then you get to kind of look at look at other things that you know you just want are just interested in or mm-hmm. like you were talking about this whole area of marketing mm-hmm. that then there is to explore and be like well is if this is something I want to explore what does that look like and mm-hmm. I think I, I really kind of resonate with that too especially like as an introvert mm-hmm. and like how do I I've kind of had to work on sharing myself more is kind Mm -hmm. of the the way that I have found it Mm -hmm. more resonates with me to kind of think about that is like oh I'm I've been doing all of this work internally and like it's not actually going to benefit anyone else unless I tell them that I'm doing it and like put it in a a context where they can Mm -hmm. make use of it but if left to my own devices, I would just kind of like create in this vacuum forever and ever. <laughs> so I'm I'm learning the skills of of sharing and feeling, you know, trying to find the ways in which that feels good for me. Mm-hmm. Like how do how do I do that in a way that feels right for me and good for me, and that allows yeah. me to make the impact that I want to make. Yes, that resonates with me because I I have done marketing courses and, and read books. And this is the way you do it. Not everyone says that. 
uh, there are like Marie Forleo, you've got to create your own way. That's her. And I love that she says everything's figure outable. It's like, oh yeah, okay. But I can figure it out for myself. Uh, but there are other ones who, this is the way you have to do it. And I, I'm not, I guess I'm not teachable because I don't want to do it that way. <laughs> I want to do right. it my way. And so I'm kind of in that place now where I'm trying to explore what you were just saying. I have these, these things that I've learned throughout my life and I want to present them in a way that fits me. Yeah. And it's, I've found that it's for a lot of people, a combination of identifying like what systems really work. For, like, am I rejecting the system because it just isn't a good fit for my needs mm -hmm. and, or are there parts of it where I, need to kind of reframe my mindset or shift mm -hmm. some, some things that are maybe like learned behaviors or um, thought patterns or like beliefs about myself and my worthiness, mm -hmm. you know, things like that, where it's like, well, actually that's the obstacle here. So kind of identifying is the obstacle something internal that I need to shift or is it like something external that I need to shift or like the system itself or like the advice that this person is giving me is not the right advice for me or like right. I just like I don't want to do that because I don't like that or is it right I don't want to do that because yeah. I like it sounds great and actually like I have no issues with it but it's scary or you know mm. like yes. where is where is the need that needs oh, to be met right. there so I'm assuming that that's what your coaching is addressing is those kinds of issues yeah it's really an exploration of like what is it that you're hoping to achieve mm -hmm. and what are those obstacles and like what is the way of of addressing them that is specific to you and mm -hmm. not um not based in like an expectation that you should like <laughs> as soon as should comes up that's usually a red flag mm -hmm. but like <laughs> that you should be able to just do the thing or that you have to do it this way in order to be successful or mm -hmm. you know there's certainly these I don't want to say kind of rules about things that kind of you you do have to do but let's say like if you if you have decided that having a social media presence really is in your best interest and that's something that you want to pursue in order to support your goal mm -hmm. but like you're having a lot of resistance to the social mm -hmm. media or you're like you don't know where to start or mm -hmm. you know, really what are the ways you can break that down and be like you know here's what I don't like about it or like Here's where I'm struggling. Mm -hmm. Kind mm -hmm. of work with that instead of feeling like. And so I, I'm very uh, uncomfortable with this kind of like pushing energy. Like I personally, I like I hate to push. I don't like the hustle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. It doesn't resonate with me. So I'm like, for me, it's more like how do I remove the obstacles to the flow mm -hmm. instead of like trying to push through the obstacles. Right. Yes. Oh, I resonate with that. How do we just make it easier and more fun? That's, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's kind of my, I've been trying to really simplify kind of my, um, my elevator pitch, so to speak, or like my tagline. So, that, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of a process of like, how do I describe to people what exactly I'm doing? And like the simplest version I could come up with was like, I help creative artists build a creative practice that make things that feel good in a way that feels good. That's like the simplest right. way I can describe it. Right. Yeah. Which yeah. seems like a no brainer, but there's so many things that interfere with that, that are telling us opposite things. Right. Cultural conditioning and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So much. Oh, thank you so much, Sarah. This has been great. Do you have anything else you want to say? Oh gosh, so much I'm sure, but I know we've covered a lot. I feel like we've covered a lot of territory. Oh, um, that's good. That's, but it's yes. been lovely. Thank well, you so much for having I, me on. Oh yes, you're welcome. I will put all of your social media outlets and your website on. And what's the name of your website? Say that. In My website is alignmentandalchemy.com. Right, good. And that's so my I, social media too, though. On Instagram, there's a underscores between the between the words okay okay good so yes I those are on podmatch and I'll get those 
links and I'll put them in the show notes for you so that people can find you because maybe there are a lot more people than just you and me and my husband and Rita, my, our friend Rita, (laughs) who are struggling with this kind of thing, you know, um, creative people who are saying, you know, I don't want to be a hard because I hate hard sell. I just, ugh. Yeah. somebody does a hard sell on me. I'm already like, get out of my face, go away. I don't even we want to wanna be able to create the things that are meaningful to us and share them in ways that feel good. Mm-hmm. You know, that's right. Exactly. Exactly. So thank you, Sarah, so much for sharing with me today. You're welcome. Thank you. Before I go, I'd like to give a big shout out to Podmatch, which I call a dating service for podcasters. Since I joined their platform, I have met so many wonderful people from all over the world, and they make the matches so easy that if you are a podcaster or you have a message that you want to share, you might want to consider checking them out. The affiliate link is at the bottom of my show notes on my website at sagewomanchronicles at sagewoman.life. Part of what I love about them is that they promote civil conversations. And can't we use that right now? So if you check them out, tell them Lucinda sent you. I'd also like to invite you to my Patreon community, where we will have chats with authors or creators. We'll have member chats about the stories that they love and occasionally we'll have extra episodes or uncut episodes of story power so please go check out my patreon page at patreon.com slash story power without the hyphen all one word i hope you enjoyed the show If you like what you heard, please share it with a friend and give us a review on your favorite podcast app. It will help people find us. And remember, as Philip Pullman said, after nourishment, shelter, and companionship, stories are the thing we need most in the world. Until next time, this is Lucinda Sage Midgordon. Thanks for listening.